I have a life message, and my life message over these many years has narrowed down to the message on grace. You can't hear enough about grace. Every sermon needs a lot of grace. There's a lot of preachers that think you have to, have to, ought to, ought to. That makes good preaching. Well, that's only half of a good sermon. You got to preach the law sometimes, but the other half needs to be grace. The sermon says you need to pray, you need to be good, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do that. Let us close in prayer. Doesn't empower anybody. It may give you the truth, but it doesn't give you the motivation. People don't change by being scared, guilted, shamed into change. The New Testament can be summed up in a word, if you will. It's the word of grace. Old Testament's law. This is what the sovereign God deserves and demands, and it's good and true. And the New Testament is this. We can never fulfill that law well enough to deserve God's love, his favor, eternal life. Old Testament is this is what you have to do. New Testament is this. This is what has been done for you. Every other religion in the world commands and requires good works to have a life after death. Christianity is counterintuitive. It's not what we have done, but it's in whom we have believed. The work has been done. The heavy lifting has already been accomplished. We enter into the finished work of the cross and receive eternal life as a gift. And when you enter into grace, all of life is seen as a gift from God. You no longer have to worry. You no longer have to fret. You no longer have to be angry at your neighbor because you're under grace. I was raised in a Christian home. I was raised Lutheran. My parents are God-fearing. Got a lot of the perfect attendance things for Sunday school. Anybody get those perfect attendance ribbons? New Life is now giving out. We give you a ribbon if you even come once a month. We have the once a month ribbons. I only missed Sunday school five times until I was age 12. That's storms, sicknesses, and I only missed five times. Yet I didn't know the Lord. I had good doctrine up here. I could pass the doctrine test that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross because of my sin and for my sin, paid the penalty for my sin, died, was buried, rose again on the third day. I now I've been adopted into God's family. I now I'm, have his righteousness exchanged for my unrighteousness. I believed all that, but I didn't know him. I had the knowledge of God without knowing God, but I didn't know I didn't know him until I met him. And then I go, what was that? What, 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 what did I just do for 18 years? What was that? And what's frightening to me is that there's a whole mass of people that are, that are right over here that have never, they don't know him. They just know about him. It's not all bad. It's a step in the right direction. At age 18, I'm laboring under a tremendous sense of guilt and depression and shame. And I knew sin was wrong. pastor never told me how to stay out of sin. I knew sin was wrong and I, and I labored under the guilt of it. I had a tender conscience. I wasn't a happy sinner, but I was trapped in sin. 
I felt like there was just a heaviness around me all the time, man. Like I had the garment of heaviness, spirit of heaviness. Go to college, and when I go to college, I see a, a, a poster on a bulletin board that advertises a Christian group. And that Christian group met at the Catholic priest's house. I was not Catholic, but he, the vicar had a home close to the campus, and we the people met there, young college students met there. First week of my freshman year, I went to that group. <laughs> didn't know if I'd know anybody. When I went to the group, I did recognize one person from high school. This group led me to the Lord. I saw Jesus personified in their love for one another, and I encountered grace. And when I encounter, see, grace and the love of God are almost synonymous terms. They're a little different, but they, they act kind of the same way on the, on the human soul. And when I encountered the love of God, that is to say I encountered the grace of God found in Christ, it is like a light bulb went on. It is like I was as light as a feather. I could not stop grinning. I got goosebumps on my arm. I, I, I can remember as if it is today, yesterday, or as if sometime recently. There was just like bumps on my arm, and I tell you, I could not believe it. It was like, why have you kept this a secret from me? I was born again. Born from above. I tasted grace. Grace is an elixir. Grace is a drug. Grace is that thing that just turns your mind and heart upside. It's totally counterintuitive. It's like I can't believe such a thing exists. There's no greater thing in the universe. It's greater than power. It's greater than angels. It's greater than the move of the Spirit. It's to taste grace. Amen. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Now he's writing this to his protege, Timothy. 2 Timothy is the last book that Paul wrote. So this was probably towards the end of his life. He'd been an apostle now, probably 20, 25, 30 years. Planted a lot of churches, traveled the world. He knows a thing or two now. And he writes, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, but I received mercy. He was saying I was a blasphemer. I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. I made fun of the cross. I made fun of Christians. Then I persecuted Christians. I threw them in jail. I separated families. I witnessed the taking of life. And he says, and I was a violent man, a religious man who was violent, who excused his violence as acts of divine judgment and righteousness. And he says, but I received mercy. Anybody in the room glad you've received mercy? Now, I might not be all those three, but I could, I could put some words in there. I was a hell raiser. I was a womanizer. And I was a man that could swear with the best of them. Those three qualities I got from Pastor Melvin I just, that's not my life. I was just putting him into my sermon to honor him today. But I received mercy. Then it goes on to say, this saying is trustworthy and true and full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save good people, to save righteous people, to save people who were trying to be good. He says, no, he came in the world to save sinners. And then Paul says, present tense, get a load of this, of whom I am, not was, I am the foremost. What he is saying here is this, every sinner is like every other sinner. There's no sinners that are a little more deserving of God's love than other sinners. 
None of us can walk around and say this, at least I'm not like that guy. At least I'm not as bad as she is. I'm just a little bit caliber better, better caliber of sinner. I have a little, I was raised better. I'm a little nicer. The Bible says everybody has sinned. Nobody's righteous. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. He's saying here, the Lord came to save everybody that's a sinner. And he says, and I am a chief of sinner. What he's saying is this, I know of no sinner worse than me. Now you might say, how in the world can the apostle Paul say that? This is why. When you're walking with God, and God does begin to sanctify you, and those last, the remaining selfishness that's in there, the remaining ego that's in there, the, 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 the gossip that's in there, those things that are still in there, when they come out of you and you, and, and you act on them, you go, God, I'm so sorry. And in that moment, you judge nobody. You say, there's no sinner worse than me. Because on the scale that you're measuring sin, you're at the top. When I got saved, I, 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 before I got saved, I had a pretty rough mouth. I mean, I could swear, I could use swear words as verbs, nouns, and adjectives. <laughs> Same word. I mean, I was, I was good at it. I, I swore so much I didn't even know I was swearing. I get saved. Stop swearing, just like that. Now, other sins kept. I had to, I'm not saying I was completely sanctified. I had other stuff I had to deal with. But the swearing part just went away, just like that. Just like that. I feel pretty darn good about it. <laughs> I was so tempted to slip a swear word in there right there, but I didn't. <laughs> oh, I was tempted. I felt really pretty good about it. 25 years later... I don't know what was happening that day. Probably something at a stop sign. Somebody cut me off. Something like that. Not only did I swear, I flipped the guy off. <laughs> All in one motion. You blood up. <laughs> and I go, what was that? Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, you can reinstate me. Thank you, I don't need to wallow in condemnation. I confess it. I was wrong. I blew it. Forgive me. And the Lord says, Dan, I still love you, and you're still my favorite. Thank God for mercy. Thank God for grace. And if you think you're past sinning, just hold on a minute. My goal in this sermon is to get that anger manifested in you. Oh, some of you are going to judge me. I know you're going to judge me, and there's going to be your sin today. <laughs> you see, grace is this unmerited favor. And I know this verse, I know we say this all the time. It's, grace is this unmerited favor, compassion, kindness, goodwill, divine assistance of God. Grace is the opposite of karma. Grace says you don't have to get what you sow. Grace says you can be blessed in spite of what you've done. It's unmerited. What does unmerited mean? It's not deserved. Oh, Pentecostals, listen to me. I know you know about grace, but you don't act like it. You act like you've got to earn it. Got to pray, got to fast, got to pray and fast, got to watch TB and pray and fast, TB and pray and fast, and then maybe God will hear me. I go, man, get a life. God doesn't hear you because of all that you do. The Bible says this, Jesus said this, God knows what you need even before you pray it. Don't say a lot of words. Make your prayers biblical. Faithful and short. God hears you. God knows. God loves you. It's his unmerited favor. Favor. What's favor? Favor is God's demonstrated delight. Think of it this way. There's a thousand people in an auditorium. And 
And God comes into the room and says, I'm going to grant the request of one person. And it's you. He comes back the next day and says, I'm going to give eternal life to one person. And it's you. Third day, you've had an argument with your spouse. You're just at the bottom of things. And you've barely get into the, and God comes into the room and says, and I'm picking you again. What's with you, man? I can't help but keep picking you. That's divine favor. You're God's favorite. I might say, well, do you mean that God doesn't have other favorites? Why do, why do you think that way? Why can't you just enjoy that you're his favorite? He likes you. I heard a Christian song the other day that said has a line in it. I don't know the name of the song. I don't know the artist. I do not know the radio station. And I'm not even sure this really happened. But I thought I heard a phrase that said, God is in a good mood. Now, I said that at Kempstall, and everybody goes, yeah, we know that song. Does anybody know that song here? Shows this, you, shows this is an old bunch. <laughs> There's this phrase, God is in a good mood. Oh, that ministered to me. Now, I know, I know a theologian is going to say, well, you've got to be careful about saying God's in a good mood. He has immutable qualities, and that's anthropomorphism, where you take the qualities and characteristics of a man and you put it on God so we can understand God. Great. Sit over there. Great. I just like the idea that God's a father, God's my creator, and God is in a good mood. Why is he in a good mood? It's called grace. His grace is all over you. He's in a good mood. I don't tiptoe. I don't mean to disrespect God, but I don't tiptoe. Like, don't hit me. He's in a good mood. Let's say you've got a very wealthy father. Let's say he's rich. And all the servants say, he's in a good mood today. Are you going to go lock yourself in the bedroom and that come out? Are you going to go sulk in the car? Are you going to just go get depressed and listen to some blues on the radio and drink some alcohol and just sink into... Are you kidding me? If he's in a good mood, I'm going to go ask some big asks. Dad, can I have a yacht? One of those big ones, those Russian oligarchs are losing. Can I have one of those? Just saying. See, this is how grace operates. It has revolutionized my life that God blesses me not on my compliance, but on my faith. There's no longer works of righteousness. Like I got to be good for him to hear my prayer. Jesus was good. He hears my prayer because I pray in his name. It's completely a different approach. You know, the gospel in Acts chapter 14 is referred to as the word of his grace. There is a place for the law. But without grace, the law will just condemn Raising a child this way, you need to do this, you need to do this, you can't do that, you ought to do this, you can't do that, you can't touch that, you can't go there, you can't do that, you can't think that, you can't have that. That child will grow up odd. They need parents that can say you need to do these things, but there's just lots of grace. When the child spills the milk at the dinner table, they don't deserve a slap. They might have just knocked it over by accident. Grace, grace, grace. Dads, so much grace coming out of you that if your teenage daughter does something, let's say your teenage daughter ends up pregnant, you're the first person she wants to talk to. Not the last, the first. Why? G-R-A-C-E is going to come from my dad. Grace. It's intoxicating. Grace is the divine enablement flowing through us to give us power and ability for living. Grace is the water 
that flows to the lowest part of your life. Max Licato. See, grace, when you understand grace, receive grace, enjoy grace, revel in grace. You could say stuff like this, I don't care what man does to me. Your view of me is irrelevant. I'm loved by God. I didn't get the promotion. God will still take care of me. I had a bad day. God still loves me and blesses me. Acts chapter 8 says this, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. There's a grace on a group of people. It says, In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and in their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. The writer of Acts, Luke, is saying this. He says, here's a little church. They're really poor. They have nothing. They're destitute. And yet they have grace. And when this grace is in that little church, he said they have overflowing joy. Overflowing joy. You guys have been to Africa. Danny's been to Africa. I've been to Africa. And... India, many of you have been to Africa. There's places in the world that don't have sanctuaries like this. There's places in the world that don't have freedom of religion. And yet these little groups of believers meet underground, in villages, in huts, under trees. And when they start singing, great is thy faithfulness, they sing it like no American church. The grace that's on those little churches, and they're in poverty, and they don't want to be in poverty. They're not saying thank God for poverty, but in the midst of their poverty, there's an abundant grace. And in that abundant grace, there's an abundant joy. How does that work when we can have everything and we walk around like we have nothing, and some that have nothing can walk around with the joy of the Lord, excited for what God is doing G-R-A-C-E, grace is found in the Lord Jesus. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 shows us how to access this grace. Not everybody enjoys it. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace through faith. Grace through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it's a gift of God that no one should boast. It goes something like this. There's grace of God's in the room today. It's all around us. It's in Jesus Christ, his son. How does that grace get released into my life? How can my emotions get the lift that only grace can give? I get the grace not by doing a great work. I get the grace by believing. I believe in Christ. I believe in the cross. I believe he has grace for me. And the more you believe it, and the more you think about it, and the more you thank God for it, the more grace seems to be released in your emotions and in your thinking. Let's say somebody in this room is stuck in porn. And this is how you're planning on getting out of it. I am going to use all my willpower... I'm going to get covenant eyes. I'm going to get an accountability partner. And boy, George, I'm tomorrow, 12 o'clock tomorrow, I'm starting this thing. All right. Okay. I'm going to give you another alternative. God, thank you for your grace that you accept me unconditionally. Thank you that your grace equips me to walk out your will for my life. My mind and heart is so full of thankfulness for what you've done for me. It's amazing when you get in this position that that little, not little, that huge temptation begins to lose its power over you. And you say, how did it lose its power? It's a byproduct of keeping your mind and heart centered in what Christ has done for you. You say, that's counterintuitive. Really, Dan, are you teasing me? 
I'm not teasing you. That's how it works. How many of you fall into lust during worship? Don't raise your hands. I don't want to. Why? You're concentrating on him. And you feel liberty and you feel in his presence and all the temptations of the world seem to kind of fall away. It's the same thing about grace. Think about grace. God loves you. Think about grace. You're his favorite. You might say, well, Dan, I, I, I really blew it. If you'll get forgiven, he who for, gets forgiven much loves much. When the prodigal son came home, it's a beautiful illustration of grace. His dad didn't chew him out. What did his dad do? Not only receive him back into the family, he had a party. He killed the fatted calf for the son. He irritated the older brother, but nonetheless, that was grace. The father giving a party for the least deserving I want to say something that's kind of weird, but you know when you're sinning and you're, and you're not really walking with God, in some ways God's pouring out even an extra amount of grace and love on you. It's not like he's going like this. It's like he's now really dialing in on you. And the goodness of God leads to repentance. Not the condemnation of the law leads to repentance. The goodness of God leads to repentance. Hearing the gospel, hearing what Jesus has done, hearing that he loves you in spite of your issues. It was a while ago. My wife and I got into the biggest argument we have ever gotten into. We've been married 44 years. I don't know when this happened. Not that long ago. I don't want to tell you the exact date. <laughs> but anyway, we got into a big one. I don't even remember what it was about. You know, most arguments start on something small, and if you don't take care of it, they eventually get over into the core issues, which are generally the husband feels disrespect and the wife doesn't feel loved and protected. That's generally where it ends up. But you start over here, and I don't know what was wrong with me that day, <clears throat> but we started going after it. And my mind was just so sharp. I had every one-liner. You know, I can't hardly talk in public anymore. Like, well, what's that guy's name? And, and where does he work? And uh, Yeah. But I was just going, bam, 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 bam. I mean, I was just nailing these one-liners. My wife, my dear, beautiful, gun-toting wife, she says, she's just bam, 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 bam. And this thing was going now. We were off to the races. And in my flesh, it felt pretty good. Because I'm really venting. And she's venting. And, we're just, and I have a little voice in the back of my mind. It's the Holy Spirit going, don't, 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 don't. Shush. Bam, 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 bam. We get done. I am exhausted. Sidebar, I do think I won. But I'm exhausted. She's exhausted. Then I have to start working on my sermon. Why argue on a Saturday? So there I am, having to begin, well, I'm... I'm not beginning, I'm finish up the sermon. My wife and I had a once a year, once every five year Donnie Brook. Now we never abuse each other. There's not profanity. We, I never lay hand on her, but it was a rough. So this is what I do. I'm broken. I feel like the chief of sinners. Like what in the world? How could I? I'm so unworthy. I can't ever get in a pulpit again. How can she ever respect me again? And I just say, Lord, I'm the chief of sinners. Thank you that your grace is not given to me based on my performance. And if there's ever a time, Lord, I need your unconditional favor, I need it right now. So I just confessed 
my sin to her. I confessed it to God. I cleaned up the mess to the best of my ability. I owned my stuff. I owned the argument. I owned it. I didn't run from it. I owned it. I gave it to God. And an hour later, I'm whistling. I sensed his favor in my life again. It was had been restored, nothing I had done, and, and I just appreciated him all the more. I didn't feel like I deserved a darn thing. It's just that I had accessed grace again, grace because of what Jesus has done for me. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go have an argument. I'm not encur- what I am encouraging you in is this. If there is a personal failure in your life, circumstances may take a while to work their way out. But between you and God, confess your sin and enjoy his grace. Receive his grace. How do you know if you've received grace? One easy test. Are you happy? There you go. Oh, Pentecostals, you know, we're going to be at the altar. We're going to pray through and our God and there's a place for it. But, you know, we're just going to do this and I'm fasting and waiting on God. And, you know, and oh, you went away for four days and fasted. Bless your heart. And, and, you know, we have all these heroes of the faith, these intercessors that live ridiculous lives that no, that no average guy can live. And they're kind of like the, the, the they're our heroes. And, and I go, yeah, I, 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 I've been in that camp. I understand it. It's not all bad. But think of it another way. All the heavy lifting has been done. The fasting has been done for you. The praying has been done for you. God is pleased with you. The cross means something for you. Not just that you get to go to heaven. It means that the cross has made a provision of God in my life to be forgiven and to find favor even if I have failed him. Faith is this daring confidence in God's grace. Religious folks think they can work their way to getting righteous. Hindus think that. Muslims think that. All were religions. They do better, do good. God will reward you. The Christian is the only one over here going, my work has already been done by a Savior. The heavy lifting has already been done. The price has already been paid. I don't have to get on the treadmill of good works. I'm in the grace of God, his favor. And I stand. The Bible says, through grace I stand. The Bible says, through grace I am what I am. Through grace, whatever good's happening in my life is because of him. I'm not boasting that I'm better than anybody else. I'm just a grace glutton. I'm a grace glutton. I could tell a person without grace, they like to judge other people. And somehow I feel they're the self-appointed critic. I like to be like the man who came before God who beat his breast and said, I'm not worthy. And then there was the Pharisee who said to God, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. And God said, which of the two left forgiven? A person under grace is a happier person. A person under grace doesn't consistently mope around about their circumstances. A person under grace says this, whether I'm employed or unemployed, God will take care of me. Grace says whether I'm married or unmarried, God will take care of me. Grace says even if my dream doesn't come true like I hope, I'm not going to mope because I have a Savior I'll share a story as I close this out today. Forgive me, this story, I I share these same stories at different times and places, so if you've heard it, just give me grace. Yeah, that's good. Eighteen years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer, had surgery, cancer-free, seven years. 
Cancer came back. They gave me max amount of radiation. The radiation did not work. They put me on a medication, not to cure the disease, but to manage it. The medicine has a shelf life of a number of years, of which time the disease morphs around it. And they could tell you where you're at on the timeline of your life by certain markers in your blood. So I go to the oncologist frequently. I go down to Duke. The elders of this church are very generous. They give me the best doctors money can buy. Thank you, Melvin. Before I go to the doctor the last, for the last 10 years, I would generally set aside two or three days to pray before I went to the oncologist. I would rent a place down in the Outer Banks. There's the Hampton Inns down in the Hampton Inn. I get a place and I fast and pray for two or three days. Listen to Christian music, confess God's promises, do solitude, right? And then I go to my doctor's appointment. It was exhausting. Pray in tongues a lot, you know. And I'm not, I don't know what it did, but I know it was the right thing to do. Four years ago, while getting ready to go to the Outer Banks to do that, in a moment of just thinking about it all, I, I, I took a daring step. And I said, God, I'm not going to do that anymore. I've done it for 15 years. If prayer could earn my healing, I have earned it 100 times over. And if tears and fasting and Christian music, if that could get it, I should have gotten it. So, Lord, I'm shifting my approach. I'm going to rest in grace. I believe you gave me a promise, and I believe the promise. I believe you're not a liar. I believe you don't bait and switch what you said you meant. I believe it. I, I've said that enough. I've confessed it enough. It's like every time I say I'm trying to convince me. Lord, you know I believe that you're God and you've done what you would do. So I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that anymore. That doesn't mean I wouldn't do it again for something else. I fasted enough. I could get twisted in my head thinking it's my prayer that's twisting God's arm to give me his promise. Rather than this, he's in a good mood. And I, I'm not praying my will, I'm praying his will, his revealed will will is perfectly clear, at least in my view, of what his will is for my life in regards to health. So the last few times I I don't do that. There's a little voice inside the, the guilt meter going, you know, you should pray. You really should pray. I do pray, but they're short, biblical, bold prayers. They're not the big, long ones. When I go to the doctor, you know, they start you in the waiting room and then they take you to a smaller room and then a smaller room. You know, windows, one window, no windows, lots of furniture, a little bit of furniture, no furniture. So when I'm in the very last room, sitting in the only chair in an eight by eight room, waiting for the oncologist to come, your blood pressure could go crazy. And they take my blood pressure, and the nurse would always say, you need to go to your happy place. I don't even know what a happy place is. Give me the address, man. But anyway, if I just sit there and rest a little bit, my blood pressure would go down. Now, reframing it, not with passivity, but reframing it with faith in grace, grace through faith, I'm saved, grace through faith, now, 
They take my blood pressure and my blood pressure is normal. The doctor could say upside down, backwards and forwards and it doesn't bother me anymore. The number could be high, the number could be low. Oh, it might obviously bothers a little. You know, I want the good number. But grace is the way to live. This is my life message. You do not have enough grace until you're drowning in it. You need so much grace that somebody's going to call you on it. Saying, okay, that's too much grace. When you get to that point, then it's okay to stop. The Romans thought grace, or the Galatians thought that grace meant that they could sin. And Paul said, nah, you've gone a bit too far. Grace doesn't mean you can sin. Real grace changes your desire to sin. People under grace are resilient. People under grace don't fear death. People under grace see something better tomorrow even though today's rough. People under grace value every person knowing there's not one person that's a worse sinner than they are. A person under grace loves to sing a person under grace makes a good friend a person under grace is somebody who loves the Lord with no strings attached I love you Lord for who you are overflowing grace Father, I thank you that your grace is on every hearer today as they put faith in a Savior and they walk in the love of a Savior that grace to be poured out in their life as the scripture says, an overflowing grace, a super abundant grace, the favor of God on their life through faith. In Jesus' name. Well, I hope that you enjoyed our sermon today. I hope that you were inspired and challenged. And maybe you have a question about something that you heard in the message today, or maybe you need prayer. We would love to take the time to pray with you and answer any questions that you might have. All you need to do is simply send us an email to online at newlife.global and we would love to connect with you. Well, be sure to subscribe to our channel. You should see the link right over here somewhere and turn those notifications on. That way you are notified every single time we go live on YouTube. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you on the next video. Take care.